Physics as a science is the study of nature and how it behaves. It is a deep analysis of how things work and behave in the universe which we live in. A fundamental part of that is obviously movement, motion in space, which we observed since the dawn of sight or even the dawn of consciousness. The most basic analysis would be whether a body is moving or is at rest. Aristotle had a basic view, kind of like an outline of a map in the analysis of movement. He said that rest is the default natural predisposition state of an object. They prefer to be at rest. And they start to move only when a force acts upon them like a push. And once that force is removed, the object goes back to its natural rest position. It followed that a heavy object would fall to the ground faster than a light one due to the larger force. An Aristotle tradition also was that we can work out the laws of physics in the universe by thought alone, and experiments are not necessary, which meant that if one follows that school of thought, he will have no motivation to conduct an experiment to test his ideas. Luckily, Galileo didn't. And he did the famous experiment of rolling balls of different sizes in slopes. This is equivalent to dropping different object of sizes from different heights to see if they gain the same acceleration. The observation was that they all gain the same rate of acceleration despite the clear difference in masses. This is one of the most important reminders that the laws of physics are not intuitive. An elephant and a laptop thrown from the same height gain the same acceleration downward. Galileo said that if you drop a large mass and a feather on the moon, they would hit the ground at the same rate in the absence of an atmosphere because they gain the same acceleration. Basically he's saying that the laws of physics on Earth extend outward into space also. This is David R. Scott testing this with a hammer and a feather on the moon. Uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? We knew this happens in the time of Galileo, but there is a question here. What is the force responsible for this? Isaac Newton explained this as he postulated his law of universal gravitation. Not only did he explain movements of falling objects to the ground, but hand in hand with Kepler's law of planetary motion, he explained how the moon revolves around the earth and how planets move around the sun. This is rocket science. I don't mean that it's hard or difficult. It is literally rocket science. Understanding orbital mechanics is what allows us to put satellites into orbit. A satellite orbiting the Earth has the same dynamics as the moon moving around the Earth. In fact, the Arabic name for a satellite is telling. It is called Al-Qamar al-Sina'i. And what that means, it literally translates to an artificial moon. There is an interesting thought experiment by Newton called Newton's Cannonball. Here is the setup. Imagine a cannon elevated off the floor. If you shoot it, the cannonball moves at a certain distance and then falls to the ground in a curved shape, like a projectile. This is because the cannon pushes it forward, but the gravity pulls it downward. If you shoot the cannon stronger, the same thing happens, but at a further distance, because the forward force is now stronger. What if you can shoot a cannonball in such a way that the forward force is balanced with the gravity force by the distance? You can get the cannonball to move around the Earth as such, assuming there are no acting forces like the atmosphere. Well. This is the model used to explain how the moon goes around the Earth, and also how planets orbit the Sun, and in fact, how to put a satellite in orbit. Like I said, this is rocket science. 
Newtonian mechanics predict the orbit as well as explain the force of falling object. Newton's genius idea was basically this. What if the same force that causes an apple to fall to the ground is the same force that keeps the moon in orbit? And that worked well. The difference between Aristotle's type of thinking and that of Newton and Galileo is that Aristotle believed in an absolute position in space, or absolute rest. But Newton's law affirmed that there is no unique standard of rest. That means Aristotle would have said if an object is at rest, then it is so for everyone looking at it. If it's not moving, then anybody that looks at it, to him, it's not moving. But Newton's idea is that the state of rest is not absolute, but relative. It is subjective. For example, if two people are playing ping pong inside a moving train, and someone is standing outside of that train, to the ping pong players inside the train, the table is at rest. It does not move, because they can play the game just normally. But for the observer outside of the train, the table is moving. It is moving this way in this direction with the train all along. Even though his laws predicted so, Newton was against the idea of absolute rest because he thought it contradicted his idea of an absolute God. And he was heavily criticized for this because it was irrational. Newton and Galileo together got rid of the idea of absolute rest. Again, position became subjective. This is something new that we knew about physics. But what about the one factor that we are all thinking about at this point? What about time? Both Newton and Aristotle agreed that time is the same for all observers. That means two people would agree on the time an event took place, but not necessarily on the location in space the event happens. Again, because space is subjective. One second is one second, and it is the same no matter who measures it and no matter whether he was standing still or moving at any speed. Makes sense, right? <laughs> that was just the beginning. We established that the laws of physics on Earth, like an apple falling, applies in space through gravitation. But what happens to the laws of physics when an object is moving at a really high speed? When something is moving at a speed we can't experience ourselves, like the speed of light. Ole Christensen Roma from Denmark in 1676 had an important observation when he was looking in the direction of Jupiter. Even though moons of Jupiter moved around it in a predictable constant rate, the time they passed behind Jupiter was not evenly spaced at different times of the year. When Earth is closer to Jupiter, they appeared earlier than when Earth is far from Jupiter. Rumors said this happens because when we are far from Jupiter, light takes a longer time to get to us, and based on the observation and the distances between planets he made a measurement for the speed of light, but because his data was not very accurate, his speed of light measurement was also not accurate. But nevertheless, it meant that we discovered that light travels at a finite speed. At least it was his suspicion. The problem with light at that time is, well, we didn't know what it was. The nature of light has always been peculiar, and a proper theory of light propagation was simply non-existent. Then came along Maxwell. In 1865, James Clerk Maxwell managed to unify both the forces of electricity and magnetism, and in doing so predicted that in an electromagnetic wave should travel at a certain fixed speed. This matched the behavior of light and that contributed to our discovery that light is a form of an electromagnetic wave. And like I said, it travels at a constant speed. But that creates a huge problem. What is this fixed speed relative to? Remember when we talked about the absence of absolute rest in the beginning? When you are driving in a car 
A passing car that is moving by faster than yours seems to pass by you in slow motion. Because you are also moving in the same direction. The car would seem to be much faster to a standing observer in the road than it is relative to you. So if light has a fixed speed always, that speed has to be relative to something that is present in the universe always. And this was the birth of a new hypothesis, the luminiferous ether. When you speak, the sound waves travel through the air, which makes the air the medium for the waves of sound. The ether was hypothesized as a similar thing, but for a light. A medium that light has a constant speed relative to and travels through. At this point, there was a heavy body of work from physicists and thinkers at the time to try to come up with experiments to detect the existence of an ether to prove it. In 1887, Albert Michelson and Edward Morley conducted a careful experiment to detect changes in the speed of light in the direction of Earth's movement compared to the speed of light at right angles to the direction of Earth's movement using an interferometer. And the result was shocking. There is no difference in the speed of light in both directions. The reaction to this experiment was big. Absolute drama. Denial from many and communities who believed the Earth is stationary and the center of the solar system interpreted the result of the experiment as the Earth being stationary and claimed that this was evidence for it. These are known as the geocentrists. Hendrik Lorenz in particular was keen on finding explanations that would maintain the idea of an ether. The matter is simply a lot more complicated if we don't find the ether. Because explaining the constant speed of light as a wave, like Maxwell predicted, would be hard. And there were many ideas floating around such as matter contracting and clocks slowing down as they move through the ether. Everything we knew was just hanging by a thread. It is a dramatic time for physics, but that tends to happen. It gets a little harder before it gets easier. One person, one unknown clerk in a Swiss patent office, a humble young person, pointed out that we don't need the idea of an ether altogether. It is wrong and it will not be found because it doesn't exist. We can get rid of the idea of an ether provided that we also get rid of the idea of absolute time. As crazy as it sounds, this person was proposing that time is relative, meaning one second is not the same for everyone. Remember when we all agreed that time is the same for everyone? Yes, that was then. The name of this young unknown person at the time was Albert Einstein. The speed of light is the same for all observers regardless of their position and movement, and since speed is distance divided by time, time has to give in, because the speed is always the same. Einstein's theory of general relativity is the end of the idea of absolute time. In the absence of the ether, Einstein introduced the solution that space and time are not separate but are fundamentally bound together and hence the name space-time. This goes hand in hand with the constant speed of light through the space-time for all observers, with time being relative as the theory suggests. Einstein went on to explain gravity as a consequence of the way the fabric of space-time is set up in the presence of masses, as opposed to an always present force between masses like Newton had proposed before. Objects were following the closest thing to a straight path called the geodesic in a curved space-time fabric that is a consequence of the masses. Mass tells space how to curve, curved space tells masses how to move. The sun creates a warped space-time around it 
and planets are simply falling into that space that is curved by the mass of the Sun. This is how gravity worked. Einstein's ideas worked well in explaining the anomaly in Mercury's orbit, which wasn't explained well by Newton's gravity. In fact, we had to hypothesize a ghost planet between the Sun and Mercury at that time, and that contributed to general relativity being accepted because it could explain Mercury's orbit also. General relativity, however, makes a lot of predictions. For example, if space-time was curved around masses and light travels in that same space-time fabric, then light should curve around masses too as a result of Einsteinian gravity. If we could observe that, we would have evidence for general relativity. If the Sun has a strong gravity field, then light from stars behind the Sun should be seen when we are looking directly at the Sun. But that is impossible to conduct because when you look at the Sun, it is blinding and you can't tell. Here came along Arthur Eddington and suggested that a good time to test this would be during a total solar eclipse when most of the light coming from the Sun is blocked by the Moon. This was observed in 1919 in a solar eclipse seen from South Africa and it showed that light indeed curves around a massive object, an object with a large mass like the Sun. This phenomenon is called gravitational lensing and it served as another evidence for Einstein's physics. Physics has now become a different field again and we achieved new breakthroughs at this time. Newton put an end of the idea of absolute position. Einstein responded by getting rid of absolute time, as crazy as it sounds, and both were proven experimentally. Our picture of the universe has revolutionized again. We are now talking about a dynamic universe instead of a static ever-existing one. But guess what? This is just the beginning. Thank you so much everybody for watching, I really hope you enjoyed the summary of chapter 2. Please share this video with all your people, a lot of work goes into these videos so that you can support my channel and support my work and help me grow. I really appreciate this, please let me know what you thought in the comments and create a dialogue, ask questions about anything that you are wondering about. Stay tuned as new episodes of the series come through. Thanks again for watching and I will see you next time. Stay safe.